Rosie, I'm so happy to meet you here in my space. I was thrilled to meet you at a friend's house um, and become aware of the power of this amazing woman. I am so drawn to people who are unique and authentic, and you truly are an extraordinary example of that. So thank you for being here. Then fast forward to, um, so I love the story of how you came to this big transition in your life. But before that, what was the lead up to this job that you were closing this big deal on and having 14 weeks vacation? <laughs> Where did you grow up? Tell us about your education. Thank you. Well, um, so really, you know, I got to start with my mom. Before I ever talk about myself, I have to talk about my mom. Um, and she recently passed away. So it's still very raw for me. And uh, that fire that I've had my entire life is just so much stronger now. Um, so it really started with her. So my parents came from Mexico to California in 1958. And they came to this town of Hayward, California, which is in the Bay Area, now part of Silicon Valley. Uh, because my dad was a seasonal worker at the Hunt's Tomato Factory in Hayward. And uh, so that uh, year, my, my parents uh, got married and decided to make that their new home. They came legally and um, uh, started their life there. Now, uh, my dad was abusive, and my mom made the very hard decision as a strong Catholic and as a very, very strong woman uh, to leave him after giving birth to nine children. So I am the sixth of nine, and we're all very close in age. So there's only an 11-year age difference between my oldest wow. brother and my youngest sister. So that was a tough decision for her, and it was the right decision. Mm -hmm. And she, uh, she could have gone back to Mexico. She stayed in this country because she knew that we could have a better life mm -hmm. there. And so uh, we were raised in our village, and it was our Catholic church, our Catholic faith. Uh, where we're all able to go to, uh, all nine of us, to 12 years of Catholic school. Um, and I do think that that emphasis on education uh, was the ticket. It really was, and is, it still is. And somehow my mom um, managed to send all nine of us off to college and still had an amazing career, her own career. Well, and what was that? Uh, she spent her entire career finding jobs for the uh, disadvantaged at Catholic Charities. So different constituencies, wow. but she ended it uh, leading this program um, called 55 Plus, so finding people jobs over 55 years old. And it was really great because um, at her recent funeral service, uh, my sister and I took her, her, her beautiful stories and her collections of files that, that we went through and one of the things, you know, she gave me that box, do not open till after I pass away box. And in this box was just um, an homage to our family, but, but an homage to her. And, and uh, like in this one file was, um, you know, her resumes, how they evolved over time and, and how she kept getting these promotions and her evaluations were in there. And it was great. And this other file was her business cards all the jobs that she had over time, all again with Catholic Charities. And then this one file that I love the most, and it was the thickest file, of course, were all these handwritten thank you notes of all the people she's ever touched. Not just the ones she found jobs for, but mm -hmm. the ones that she was the neighborhood translator, the neighborhood driver, the neighborhood, um, uh, you know, she even provided vaccinations right. for people. I mean, she was the person. She was the one that... that um, uh, that did everything, not just for us, but for the community. And I got to tell you, what was more telling about her service was, of course, I received a lovely letter from the president who adored my mom mm -hmm. and who remembered her name every time he saw her. But uh, I also received a letter from the president of Notre Dame University who remembered my mom because um, it's a funny, funny story. Um, and I had told him that she was sick. And so when, when she passed, he sent this mm -hmm. letter but, but the long and short of it is he spent his first year out of the seminary at our parish. And, uh, and, and my mom made such a, an impact on him that he remembered her, what is that, 50 years mm -hmm. later? Um, it's just like she, her right. legacy is, is huge. I, you know, um, it's listening to your story. I, I, I have 
stories about my mother too and the extraordinary um courageous adventurous especially for my mother's age group i'm older than you are she was she could have run a huge corporation had it been another time and women with the, the ability that your mother had my mother uh still manage to affect not only their neighborhood, but their town, the village, the church. They really impacted human beings. And it didn't get wasted on us, for sure. And nine, nine children, and just did it on her own. I am just, you You are so lucky. I'm so lucky. I am yeah. absolutely lucky. She, she had nothing and gave us everything. And, and so at her service, my sister and I put together this, this kind of, this is your life set of storyboards. And it was so great to have her friends and, you know, her yeah. family come into this reception and to see this huge, gigantic yeah. wall of these storyboards right. of her life. It was just, um, yeah. it was, it was, uh, it was the best yeah. service. She and could it, have. It, I did a similar thing for my mother oh. too. I, she was an artist too. So mm -hmm. I had all of her art and all of the things that she'd done for people and, um, and it, it really is is a great um, privilege. We we are privileged in in the most special way to have not only that gene pool, but to have that influence without ever being taught that this is the way to be, but just watching the way you should be. No, that's exactly right. No, that's and look. I mean, it's a story of values more than anything. You know. It, it's interesting. I'm not exactly as as, as Catholic, perhaps, as, as we were raised, but but again, to believe in something, mm -hmm. and 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 I believed in her, right? I believed in her is mm -hmm. what I believed in, and and it's interesting if you think about that time period. Look, I was born in 1965, and 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 so I was raised in an era of 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 change, profound change yeah. in this country. Mm -hmm. And, and, and it wasn't just what was happening, what you saw on TV, it was happening in my own home, right? For my mom to feel empowered in a way that our country and women in particular have never felt empowered mm -hmm. before, that, that she found that strength in herself. Yeah. And I think that strength was always there, but you know, it, it, was, it was a desperate choice that she had to make, right? It was for our safety and her yeah. safety that she did what she did. Uh, but she also, again, as I mentioned, made the conscientious effort to stay in this country where she knew very few people mm -hmm. and, you know, except for her, her, her village. Right. But the thing about what's happening during that time and the way we grew up, you know, I'm one of six girls and, and our view of feminism, our view of feminism was, was through a very narrow, narrow lens. What was happening on TV, right? What was happening on TV was bra burning and, you know, abortion rights and contraception. And look again, coming from a very faith based community, that wasn't exactly embraced. It wasn't exactly <laughs> right, embraced. Right. And so, you know, the only thing I can think of growing up, you know, as, as 10 years old, et cetera, was, oh my God, they're all going to hell, right? What I didn't realize is that feminism was around me the entire time. Mm -hmm. And it was Absolutely. personified in my mom. Yeah. And, and that's what I think people don't understand about that era. Mm -hmm. And that era giving a voice to so many people like my mom. And so I, I think, you know, the... When the history books are written and when we think about this era of feminism, it can't, it has to be all of it. It has mm -hmm. to be all of these heroes. Yeah. These heroes that found their own voices. I mean, think about you. Can I just do this for a second? Just for a second. Because again, I remember you like it was yesterday. And I remember when you first came out and look, it was, you know, I was what, eight years old. I think <laughs> when you, when you first came out with, with, you know, the, the parachute mm -hmm. suits, right? But think about that. That was 1973. You did that before women were legally allowed to apply for their own credit card. Yes, that's, I remember it well. I remember it well because I was in business and um, I was married and I believed, like everybody else, that the man runs the business um, until I realized that I couldn't stay in a bad situation like your mother, different story, and that I had to leave with $95 to my oh, name. 
and mm -hmm. I couldn't get a loan. I couldn't get, I, I had to borrow from friends and anybody that knew me and I was sort of quiet and hidden away. But, the, but it, it was a time that exploded with an energy for women to start a conversation. But because you had this extraordinary woman who was an example that you saw every day, yeah, did she speak fluent English? So, so the way we grew up, so yes, but we grew up with, with uh, my mom spoke Spanish to us and we spoke English back. So it was okay. kind of important. She felt it was very important. Obviously, yeah. we all thought so, to, of course, right. to learn the language, to right. be fluent right. in the language. Um, but, but yes, she, she, she was fluent, though. Yeah. Absolutely. So my mother... And learned it here, yeah. by the way. My mother was Lebanese, but she grew up in Puerto Rico because they, she was, they, they traveled and traded. And they, her father left her mother and five girls uh, in Puerto Rico. And so my mother's language was Spanish. And she married uh, a Spanish man that she met at the World Trade, at, at the, the, uh, the big, you know, World... United Nations? No, no, no. Like the, uh, the big events, I'm forgetting. World's Fair? World's Fair. And, um, and so they spoke Spanish. But when I was born... She said, "No, they these kids are going to assimilate." And so, unfortunately, my Spanish is sample room Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> so I can I can talk about clothes in yeah, Spanish, yeah, but yeah. but I I really appreciate that she understood that we would need to assimilate yeah. and that we would need to get a great education, yeah. just yeah. the way your mother clearly made that an effort not only to get you through high school, but yeah. then, I mean, how she did that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so it was, assimilation was also a very big concept in the 70s, too, right? I mean, that's when, I mean, look, that's, you know, we, we as, as, as a Latinx community still have to choose white in the census data, yeah. right? And that was a concerted effort for assimilation for, yeah. for the Latino yeah. community right. back then. Even though, okay, I gotta tell you, the first time I found my dad's birth certificate, and the birth certificate, uh, my, excuse me, my birth certificate, and, and it, on there, it shows that my dad was white. And I'm thinking, wait, my dad looks like Martin Luther King. <laughs> my, the, the, the first thought, the first thought when I first found that, I was probably seven years old, was, oh my God, it's not my real dad. That was my first thought, because I'm thinking, wait, Whoa, that why? Is so crazy. Right? Because think about that. Yeah. My dad was not white. He was not white. But yet, yeah. we had to check that box. Well, what, and what does somebody who's Lebanese check? My father was Basque and Lebanese, and my mother was Lebanese, and so I don't know what box to check yeah. either. Like, yeah. What? Um, I don't know. Yeah. You, the, well, we, I mean, we have to. We are still evolving as a nation. Right. That's for sure. And, that, you know, that's and you know what? I think um, over it all, how lucky we are to we check boxes that Absolutely. didn't make sense. Yeah. But we created our own checks in our own, Absolutely. establish our own identity Absolutely. so that the box may be not as important for us at that time. That's right. We certainly, but so your education, what did you choose to study? Yeah. So, so, uh, you know, I, I go, I have to go back to my champions again. So, so here's what happens. So I worked full time in high school. In fact, I was the family breadwinner at the time. I had this amazing job at uh, the County Library headquarters. So I thought I won the lottery because I had access to any book I ever wanted. And, and it was the, it was the central place where all the books came to before they went to the branches. So you name the book and I was obsessed oh with Shakespeare. Goodness. I was obsessed with, wow. with science fiction. I couldn't get enough books. I just couldn't. And that was my window to the world. Wow. So I would work uh, at this place at Alameda County, uh, Alameda County Library Services. I worked, uh, from, um, three to nine, around three to nine every day weekends. Um, and then I would come home and I would, uh, you know, change, eat dinner and start my homework at 10 PM, 10 to one. That was my schedule. 10 PM to 1 AM was my homework schedule. Uh, and then start again the next day. And, and, and I, again, I, I, I 
you know, no one should have to work full time in high school, but mm -hmm. at the same time, it wasn't the worst life. No. Again, I loved my job. Mm -hmm. I loved school. It was my life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I'll, I'll never forget what happened my junior year in high school. Uh, this woman by the name of Lisa Kiros from New York, uh, uh, she uh, most recently headed up the Time Warner Foundation. Uh, at that time, she was, I think, um, she was already, she had, she had already graduated from Harvard. She was working in the admissions mm -hmm. office. And, you know, you're, they, they scout by looking at your PSAT scores. Mm -hmm. So I got the call. And I took the PSAT. And she says to me, she says, hi, my name is, is Lisa Kiros. Have you ever thought about applying to Harvard? And this is how arrogant I was as a junior in high school. Right. Good God. Look, I lived in Silicon Valley, born and raised. And if you're going to go anywhere, you're going to Stanford. You know, I, I lived on, on the other side of the San Mateo Bridge and, and Stanford is just on the other, you know, mm -hmm. across the bay. If you're going to make it, that's where you're going right. to go. Right. That's where you're going. So I said to her, I said, you know, thank you. Thank you so much. But no, no, no. I'm going to Stanford. <laughs> it was, it was, who did I think I was? And then she said to me, she says, she says, look, you know, we'll waive the admissions fee, which I think was oh. $50 at the time. $50 is my life yeah. savings, right? right? We'll waive the admissions fee. You have nothing to lose. Why don't you just go ahead and apply? You can make your decision when you make your decision. Right. Great. All right. Sure. So, you know, back then we were doing our, our applications on typewriters, right? right? So I did. I applied to Harvard, Stanford, and Berkeley. Um, and I'll never forget, you know, back then you knew exactly when the admissions decisions were coming in mm -hmm. by mail, right? So I remember, I remember the day that it was going to happen and I came home. And, uh, and I walked in the door and, uh, I heard my mom crying. My mom never cries. I heard her crying in the kitchen. And I'm thinking, oh my God, I didn't get in. My first thought, I didn't get in. Uh -huh. So I walked into the kitchen and she was crying because I got it. Oh, okay. So, uh, so it was a big decision. Again, I was a family breadwinner. Um, I was very close to my mm -hmm. family. Uh, but um, I also knew at that time it was the best decision that I could make. Yeah. And um, it is what led my mom to start a career at Catholic Charities. So there I was. I started Harvard in 1983. I helped my mom before I left put together her resume, you know, kind of thought mm -hmm. her through about right. some, some options. And she didn't get in this job. She started working in 1984. That's her so career great. just took off from That's there. That's so great. So in some ways, right, it was it, it took that level of shock, if you will, mm -hmm. shock to the system, to also uh, empower her. And she found her own voice. That's I, I, I really believe working as soon as you can gives you a sense of how it's going to be, yeah. you know, what the reality is when you get out there. So the education you choose is really done through a different lens than some sort of mystical job and you have no idea of what that will be when, until you get there. But I think the idea then of your mother looking, how old was she at that point? At the time, let's see, so, so let's see, that was 1983, so she was what, 30, 35? So I, I really think even now more than ever, that a woman's opportunity to work at different phases, like I, I think 35 is a big turning point for women in, in what they do in, in, in 30, that 35 to 45, but then 50 is the big one. Yeah, I said it's 45, sorry. 45, that but that's that, that big, and then 50, so she started 45, so yeah. she was just building to 50, yeah. right? Yeah. And 50, from my my vision of this is 50 and forward is the best time. Absolutely. It well, is the best absolutely. time. Absolutely. And, and, and let, let me just put this in perspective. First of all, uh, she had been working. So 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 we were, <laughs> talk about the village. One of the jobs that she had, many jobs, one, she catered weddings with her amazing tamales. She catered a lot of activities <laughs> with those tamales. Right. So, and they're very, very hard work. So she sold tamales. Um, and, and then the other was, uh, she did a lot of aftercare, uh, after school care. So we had, you know, half a dozen kids, maybe more right. at our house after school. That's so great. So, you know, again, we all worked and, you know, my siblings worked, we all worked. Yeah. So we all worked very, very young, usually at 14. Yeah. So, so we all contributed. We all, you know, had a job to do, if mm -hmm. you will. But having that full-time job that she needed to do starting at the age of 45, was probably one of the best things that ever happened to her. Yeah. How she, and, and here, here's the thing, I'll never forget my, my uncle, 
uh, who's two years younger than she is and her best friend, and of course spoke at her eulogy. He's a missionary in Haiti, uh, a Marist brother. Wow. Still working at 83 as, mm -hmm. as a missionary. But he spoke at her at her eulogy. Uh, he said a eulogy recently, and, and um, I talked about, you know, my mom, who literally had no formal education. Her brothers mm -hmm. did. Her brothers were all sent off to, of course, these great schools. Yeah. But she was the oldest girl, and her responsibility was to the homestead. And eventually, she went off to help her aunt, uh, who was a mother superior, run an orphanage in the middle of Guadalajara, Jalisco, Mexico. That was her school. And, and so she really didn't have any formal mm -hmm. education. So when you think about someone who uh, came from nothing except her grit and her courage and her fortitude mm -hmm. and her persistence and perseverance, all of that together to take on the world the way she did right. and succeed in the yeah. way she did. So, so as my uncle was talking about this at her eulogy about you know coming to this foreign land, coming from nothing and building everything, not just in what she built in her kids, but investing in herself. Mm -hmm. It's the best thing she ever did. Yeah, yeah. And and so what was the, um, so your mother and father decided to come to a strange place. Yeah. Did they know anybody or they just came? No. They no. didn't know anybody. No, I mean, we had some distant, very, very distant people we would call cousins, but there were, you know, there were some folks that I think became part of this village, um, and, 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 and they came into it, so, so, and it kind of evolved over time. Mm -hmm. the, I, I, I really admire, deeply admire people who are brave enough to pick up, leave a life that they know for an absolute unknown and and create a new life and i look at new york and i think that's what new york is Absolutely. everybody here is grit and they and they are really the best of that pioneer adventure and and your mother certainly um expresses in the way she lived her she life is the that manifestation. This is, yeah, absolutely totally. i mean go to any naturalization ceremony right and you will see the, the gratitude, yeah. the appreciation, that grit that you mentioned, yeah. there's a reason why people are still coming to this country, mm -hmm. right? It is still, it's, it's the best place. It's still the place where you can yeah. make your dreams come true, where you can That's pursue it. this American dream, where you can pursue economic mobility yeah. in a way that you, this is almost impossible. Uh, absolutely. In the same way yeah. any other country. The minute you, the minute any American starts to complain, um, there will be somebody who's not American. Who will tell you how crazy you are? Oh, that's exactly right. They will tell you, "Are you nuts? Are no, you that's crazy?" Exactly. I just spoke at the uh, earlier this year at the Global Business Summit in New Delhi, and and you know there's four million Indian Americans here in the U.S. Mm -hmm. and and there I am in New Delhi speaking at the summit, and I had a chance to meet the Prime Minister, etc. And it, it's amazing when you hear the stories even over there about how fortunate we are here. Yeah, how fortunate but we are. It's here. A, it, it, People from, I mean, everywhere will tell you that, like, there is, that's it. That's where you can make it. The And do you have children? I do. I have a 27-year-old son and a 23-year-old daughter. They are the, 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 the love of my life. Absolutely. And, and how did they react to your mom? How did, what was their relationship with, because I think every other generation have this amazing connection. It couldn't be closer. Yeah. It couldn't be closer. I was the fortunate one where my mom actually lived with me. Uh -huh. And so I was also the fortunate one where my kids were born and she was there as part of my village. Uh -huh. I don't know how people do it otherwise. I really don't. Mm -hmm. And and so uh, I was very, very, very close to my mom. Um, and so to have her be with me as part of this village, um, again, you know, beyond grateful, beyond grateful. Mm -hmm. And so both my kids... You know, when she first got sick, when she first had her, her first stroke, you know, they dropped everything and came out, of course. Um, both of them, when she had her, her latest seizure, dropped everything, of course, and came mm -hmm. out. That's just the way they are. And, and, and even when I had to tell them, uh, when I was on the plane uh, heading home, and I had to tell them that, 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 uh, that she had just passed. And, and they were bawling, there I am on the plane, and my kids are bawling mm -hmm. on the phone, and we're oh. FaceTiming. And it was, it was you know, it, was, it impacted them a lot. And still, very yeah. much so. They, but as you will know and experience, um, 
that I learned with my mother, she will be around you and you will feel her and know that she's there. Oh, absolutely. No, no. Again, you know, I'm not exactly a ghost kind of person. No, but, 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 but if you walk into my house right now, it's an altar to her. It's still the storyboards are in my house and I haven't taken them down yet. And I don't know when I'll take yeah. them down when I'm ready. All right. But, but not yet. But you'll, but. you'll a- absolutely feel uh, her energy. They're, feel they're strong energy. That I you feel it. I feel yeah. it. And if you, re- if you met my kids, you would see it more so in them. Again, look, I was very fortunate to have her in my life. I was also very fortunate to have my in-laws. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm not married, uh, but my in-laws um, at the time, um, and they lived and breathed with my kids. And so I called them the breakfast club. My mom was living with us, and my in-laws would come over every day at 7 a.m. I love it. And, and, and the breakfast club was, you know, <laughs> alive and well. And, you know, look, I, I, I think the best way to explain it um, is uh, too many ways, but, but one of the, the first ways that I really saw it was uh, when my son was applying to college. Um, and and he, uh, one of his college essays was called The Tale of Two Grandmas. And he starts off the essay by saying, I am Joey. And he goes on about his grandmother from Guadalajara, Jalisco, Mexico, and his grandmother from Hokkaido, Japan. Uh. Never once talking about their differences, but talking about how they both raised them with common values mm-hmm. of family, food, faith, and unconditional love. And he ends the essay by saying, I am Joey. You might see him as one versus the other, Mm -hmm. but he's a product of all of it, a combination of all his experiences. That is so beautiful. And I think that's probably a great way to think about this next generation Mm -hmm. of millennials and post-millennials. And we talked about those boxes Mm -hmm. earlier. They don't want to check a box. Yeah. So so when it it comes to kind of, you know, um, how they identify, how they think about institutions, it's very, very different, yeah. right? And I think the reason is because anyone born in the mid-90s and later was born with the internet. So access to information changed everything, yeah. right? And so it's no longer what they're taught at home or what they're taught in the classroom. Right. It's what they see. It's what they can look up. It's what they know mm. or don't know, right? The good, the bad, the ugly, the internet. But, but for them, it's, you know, it's, it's complete optionality and fluidity. Mm-hmm. And that's going to be the same whether it comes to religion, partisan politics, mm-hmm. gender, uh, ethnicity, so you can't really box them. Yeah. And so yeah. we, as we talked about these boxes, which we started to talk about at the beginning, they don't want the boxes. No. And, and what you also profoundly described is family. And it can be, you know, a family you create. It can be a, a family that's blood family, a family of friends. Absolutely. It could be a work family. Yep. Um, family... In whatever form it comes, and there can be many in your life, are so valuable the the structure of having people who care about you and that you feel a part of is is really meaningful. And I think that's one of the areas we need to recognize and to say if you don't have a family. You can create one. You can find ways of your having village. your breakfast club your or your village. Absolutely. But a lot of people are, are lonely yeah. right now. Especially since the pandemic. Absolutely. Like, n- incredibly lonely. Yeah. I've had doctors on the podcast and talking about loneliness uh, in a way that I think we've never really recognized as serious uh, uh, before. Yeah. And the importance of your story that you just told right now, I really want to emphasize it because it it's a way to not think about loneliness, not think about being alone. Yeah. Um, the fear of that that place is is quite scary. Absolutely, and and I think that's exactly what it is. It is fear, and to, what, what's what's the counter to fear is courage. Right, mm-hmm. and finding the courage to get out of your own skin, yeah. get out into the real world, however you want to describe yeah. that, right? And so I think that is the one thing that was so powerful with my mom is that ability to take strategic risks, mm-hmm. right? And to get out of your comfort yeah. zone. Get out of your comfort yeah. zone. There is nothing comfortable right. about anything that she did, not once, not yeah. ever. And that is something that I try to ingrain in my kids all the time. You know, if you met my daughter, my God, she's the one. Mm-hmm. When you meet my son, my yes, absolutely. He's my pride. His name is Joey. He's my pride, <laughs> Joey. Absolutely. <laughs> but when you meet my daughter, ah, okay, mm-hmm. then you'll understand how the world works. Yeah. Because 
I, I do feel like she came out that way, but I, I also think that, that we also did have to harness a little bit more. Uh, her village, you know, with the Breakfast Club is really interesting because they all lived and breathed for her. They all really did. And, 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 um, <laughs> and I would, I would describe her coming out as, as very regal. That's the best word to describe mm -hmm. her. And, and at one point I had to make the conscientious decision to get her out of what I called at that time the Forbidden City mm -hmm. because it was just too much on this one person and it was time to get her socialized. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and the, the challenge was that she, she wouldn't want to socialize with other kids. She didn't want to get out into the, the, pl the play date structure because she had this this unconditional who, yeah. doesn't, who doesn't yeah. want what she now <laughs> and so uh, and I never I'll never forget coming coming home one time from work and she was probably she was probably three years old uh, maybe turning four and I walk into the house and there is one grandparent feeding her or one grandparent she had her arms out one grandparent putting on her coat and the other grandparent was putting on her oh shoes God. to take her outside into the backyard I'm like nope this isn't gonna work. She knows how to do all of that, and, and I and I love look. I I, I am so grateful right. to my in laws and my mom for what they did right. with her. She's she's perfection beyond perfection. Right. But I knew it was time. Right. Even we have to we get her to be more perfect. And so you know that's when I started Montessori for her. Best oh, thing really? I ever did. Oh, really? Best thing I ever did. Started her in Montessori, uh, where she met some friends. And then through those friends, she met this one friend that became her best friend. And it was her best friend that wanted her to start dance with her. Ah. So I got to tell you, it was dance that got her out of this bubble, that ah. got her out of her own skin. And she became a completely different right. person. It that's was the, the best thing yeah. I did. But the universe takes us to where we're supposed to go. Absolutely. So, um, so back to your education. Yep. So now, um, what were your interests and where did you decide to really focus your education? Yeah, so, you know, I went to Harvard. And, and, and so it's a liberal arts school. And it's they didn't really have a lot of vocational programs. So, you know, that they, 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 they don't even have accounting, for God's right. sakes. And so, so <laughs> that's why I'm asking it's, you no, this question. So, so I actually, so it's only, I always thought I'd be a lawyer. I wanted to be a family lawyer okay. uh, until my junior year in college. And then I, I realized that, um, you know, I had more of an interest in community building and kind of bricks and mortar in a strange mm -hmm. way. And real estate was kind of what piqued my interest. And so, strangely enough, and so, but, but my, my, my major, I was actually the first person in Harvard's history ever to combine the two majors that I combined. So I didn't want to choose. Why choose when I could do both? Mm -hmm. So I combined sociology and romance languages and literatures, first time ever. And it was very difficult because uh, you have two different departments that you have to satisfy. And in the end, you have to write an honors thesis. Mm -hmm. And your thesis is going to be graded as if the other department didn't exist, oh, which is very, very challenging. Uh, I loved it. I absolutely loved it. And I actually, the second that I got that process formalized, others came behind me, which is really great. Mm -hmm. So it started something. Yeah. Um, but I will say what really opened my eyes at Harvard and the experience that I had that I, I think and still is, is to this day in, in, in place is something, um, you know, look, when you, when you turn 18, anyone turns 18, that is usually when you start making your own decisions, right? It's usually when you go off to college, you start voting, mm -hmm. you open up your own checking account, you even choose what you want to eat for the very first time right. in your life. Right. And so that, that experience of having that independence for the very first time, and look, I was, you know, practically in a cage my whole life, right, in terms of the life that I had before mm -hmm. I went off to school, which is why I made the choice that I did, going to right. the other right. side of this yeah. country, this foreign land yeah. of Cambridge, Massachusetts, out of my comfort zone, right? Yeah. But boy, did I dive right in. And and for a lot of people, it is their introspective. Mm -hmm. It is when they look at themselves for the very first time yeah. as an individual. And I realized that I actually loved the cultural parts of what I was leaving behind. Mm -hmm. And I decided as a freshman that I, I dove into, uh, Harvard had a, had a folk dancing, Mexican folk dancing group called Ballet Folklorico. And so I dove right in. You're I kidding. loved it. I loved it. I ended up becoming the director of it. But, but here's what was so funny, is those first two years, you know, your freshman year, your sophomore year, we had these great performances. It was usually Cinco de Mayo, you know, something like that. But we, had, we, we practiced every week, and I thought there had to be more of an opportunity mm -hmm. to share this beautiful right. expression. Right. So it took me a couple of years, but it, with the help of, um, actually, with the help of, 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 I mentioned Lisa Kuras, the one who yeah. helped me think about getting into Harvard in the first place, 
know, so she was there. She got me a job in the admissions office where I worked all four years. Oh my she was also kind of my champion uh, with what I started at the Harvard Foundation. Uh, and Dr. Alan Counter at the time was the director. Um, I started Cultural Rhythms. And Cultural Rhythms was a way for the campus to come together as a day of expression, however you wanted to, to find culture. Now, look, back then, you know, we had our <laughs> Bali Pocorico, maybe we had a, a, you know, we had a, maybe a Chinese group, Chinese dancing group, and maybe um, we had, you know, acapella, that was Harvard's culture, yay, mm -hmm. we brought them in. Right. We had to go out of the community uh, where we got a, a Greek Orthodox folk dancing group and a couple others, because we, we had to cobble this right, together. Right, right. But it started in the spring of uh, 1986. Wow. And it goes to this day. It still goes on to this day. And here's the thing about culture. How I define culture, it's the threads of the fabric of a community that come together mm -hmm. however you want to define yeah, culture. Yeah. And I got to tell you, when I know I, I made a difference, I was invited back every year after I left, every year. And I remember coming back, I think it was the 10 year, the 10 year anniversary of Cultural mm -hmm. Rhythms. And it was, it's this, it's this performance piece and it's also a food festival. And the food festivals where a lot of the student groups were actually able to raise money for the year, mm -hmm. which was really great. And it grew. It's now an audition. It's oh two days. It's amazing. Oh, my God. I know. It grew. <laughs> but here's the beauty of it. When, when I think it was the 10-year anniversary, when I went to Memorial Hall where the food festival was, um, uh, I walked in, and the first thing I saw was the, was the world's largest rainbow cake. <laughs> and I thought to myself, oh, my God, they get it. They get yeah. it. It's not just about ethnicity. Right. It's not just about race. It's not just me dancing for right, you. Right. It's, it's including how everyone. to how to how can one feel comfortable enough right. to express themselves and feel like they're part mm -hmm. of this village. Yeah. That's what culture is. Yeah. It right? totally is. And so so I'll tell you what happened. This is another great, great story. Maybe at the 20 year reunion. This has been going on now for a long mm -hmm. time. At the 20 year reunion, and, and this is when I was being honored, I think, and 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 um and this is when they actually uh, retired one of my dresses from the Ballet of Hokkaido, and they gave oh it to me. God. I still have it. I still, it's in my closet. I have it. But but so they brought in, you know, at that time, Harvard just started its own mariachi. Its own mariachi at Harvard. Uh, I think it's called Veritas. I think it's what it's called. I'm like, oh, my God, it has mariachis, and it's great. And so they come in, and they're, they're, they're performing for me, which was really nice. Uh, but I noticed, ready for this, that both violinists were Asian. I thought, well, this is interesting. Oh, wow. Right? This is interesting. Yeah. So I'm like, all right, wait a minute. I got to talk. So, so after they performed, it was really nice. And I went up and I thanked them. I said, well, it's so great that Harvard now has a mariachi. Who'd have thought? Who'd have thought? Right. right. And so I, I, I said, look, I got to ask you guys this question. I said, I said look, I got to ask you this question. What inspired you to join this group? Did you know of this music before you came here? And they said, no, absolutely not. I said, one of them was, you know, my roommate was in the Baifa Corico, and they told me about them. They think about starting this mariachi, and I thought, well, interesting, fun. Yeah, sure, why not? So I, I love joined. It. I and love the it. other one said, he said, look, I've been doing classical music my entire life. Here I am, making my own decisions, heard the music totally out of my wheelhouse. Why not? Why not? But look, so to have the ability to go, again, out of your comfort zone, to do what is so unexpected, right, right. so unexpected, and then own it. You're going to mm -hmm. spend your personal time yeah. doing this is amazing. It's it's really, it's the it's the formula for success. I really believe it. When you take chances or, you know, so many people here will say to me, Norma, I've never done this before. And you really want me to do it? It's like, I haven't done it before either. This is new for me. That's what magic They were happens. trying new things. That's the magic. And, that, and that's it. That's the magic. It's, and and though that's a great story of, you know, the visual of it right. is so perfect. Wait, one more, one more. Because this happened at the 30 year anniversary. Oh so, my God. So no, there's more. There's more. So, so again, I go all the time. And it's really, really fun. I haven't been to what since COVID. They had to put a, put a mm -hmm. stop in. And I think the last. Um, MC, uh, the last host, I think, was, was Lady Gaga, I think. But the first one was Debbie Allen. Amazing, 1986. Oh How beautiful God. is that? I yeah. love her. So, but, but anyway, the 30-year reunion, um, I'm backstage. I, I think I was hosting. I can't remember. I was backstage. And, and I, was, I was meeting one of the groups that was practicing. And it was a group called the Harvard Thud. Thud was an acronym for the Harvard Undergraduate Drummers. And what it was, ready for this, 
it was a group of percussionists who all had their own kind of skill sets, but they made cups. Uh, they made music with those cups, you know, those plastic yeah, cups. Yeah. It was like a symphony. It was right. crazy stuff what they were doing. I said, look, I got to I gotta ask you guys, because this is a little unusual. It's amazing what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So talented, all of you. Right. What made you do this? And they're all the founders of this, by the way. They're right, all the, right. the founders of the Harvard Bud. Yeah. And they all had similar stories to what the violinist said. I used to be a drummer. I used to be a, you know, whatever it was. We're all percussionists. But we all thought, you know what? Done. Let's do something different. And this is what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Together they come and they find their creative outlet. Yeah. That's culture. And they're all, by the way, white. So, right, again, look, it doesn't matter what you look like, who you are. If you love it. How yeah. you want to find yeah. culture, that's the theme. That's Absolutely. what has to sustain yeah. itself. And that's the best part of our country yeah. is we are kind of a nation of nations. We are this beautiful experiment, social mm -hmm. experiment of all these cultures coming together. Yeah. And how do we take that and advance that? It's a, you know, it, it has to be the way we look at coming back together again. I think um, it, it, we sort of are going through this stress that's separating us yeah. and stressing us out. That's right. But, and, and I have, a great belief in in this country and in all that's possible and in the character of the people that are here because everybody's an adventurer, right? Everybody either was a pioneer or Absolutely. they came here. And unless you're indigenous or unless you're right. brought here without your permission, right? Everyone came yeah. here to build their dreams. And then when you're here, there is an opportunity. To, but to bring us back together, yeah. um, you know, I, I, I say this a lot. When, when I was growing up on the news, there was Martin Luther King, yeah. JFK, Gandhi, yeah. and Gandhi, right? Yeah. And not perfect, imperfect men, but... The inspiration and the idea of bringing people together, bringing people together, loving one another, appreciating what we give to each other, we are missing out on that. Part of it is we're on our phones. Part yeah. of it is we're, we're not touching. We're not yeah. hugging each yeah. other. And the doing the lost. 60s and 70s Absolutely. were all hanging on to each other. Absolutely. We need to find a way, whether it's dancing again and everybody dancing more yeah. and doing that together yeah. but uh but we need to bring back that exchange yeah. of experiences yeah. that you can only have when you have a friend who eats a different way does yeah. things in a different way and when you experience it and you think wow yeah I can, I can have that. That's exactly I can right. feel that. Uh, so let's go back to that time period because I think you're leading up to something very, very important. One of my first memories, of course, was Martin Luther King and Robert, uh, Robert okay. Kennedy Jr. Yeah. getting shot. I mean, of course, I remember that. But, but I also remember, you know, of course, I remember the Vietnam War, you know, the, the tail end of it, and, and, of course, what happened with Nixon. But, and then what happened? So we were leading up to a very tumultuous time in our history, very, very tumultuous time. Um, and, and, and we were still evolving in many, many ways. Women were finding their voices. Mm -hmm. You know, again, that, that, that Equal right. Credit Opportunity Act didn't even pass until 1974 mm -hmm. where you could even apply well, for your credit Well, when did card. women start to vote? <sighs> technically, last, right? Technically, last. right? Technically, last, 1920. Yeah. yeah. Technically, 1920. But even, you know, the, 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 uh, the Lots Civil of Rights time Act. to cast Civil up. Rights yeah. Act, right? Uh, in, the, in the 60s yeah. also helped uh, in, in parts of the South, et cetera. But... But leading up to that period in the 70s, there was a moment where the country came together. Do you remember what that was mm -hmm. for? Well, I, I think um, there were a couple of, yeah. I, I think there were a couple of important um, periods that whether it's the, the war that yeah. brought us together or the feeling of, um, I think, the, the feeling of love and peace was possible, yeah. that the population believed that love and peace yeah. was po Absolutely. possible. Absolutely. And music was a big part of that. Yeah. Music, music was, was a big, huge part of that, big, right? Big part. Absolutely. What was coming from LA, what was coming right. from here, absolutely 
music was a big part of that. So, right. so there was this kind of cultural revolution right. that happened. Um, again, in the African American community, found mm -hmm. their voice as well. Um, but then, leading up to what became, and hopefully we're going to talk about this, the bicentennial of mm -hmm. 1976. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to hear your memories of the bicentennial because I remember like it was yesterday. But I want to hear yours. Well, um, I, I'm looking forward to your conversation about the bicentennial because for me, I love um, the idea of a celebration and that we're such a young country. Yep. Um, and I remember it actually from a fashion perspective. Yes. Um, because I was thinking, what, how can I express what this incredible time Absolutely. in history is about? Absolutely. And I kept, um, interestingly enough, I kept thinking about the indigenous people. Yeah. I kept thinking about how, um, how important it was that there were people here who were the, the first owners, Absolutely. the first the first people yep. of this country. And then the flow of different cultures. So I found myself um, really expressing different cultures in the clothing. And I'm not a designer who typically has a, a theme like India or, you know, but I, I found myself doing things that really related to the, the, the cross cultures, the multiculture um, aspect of the country. And, um, and I am specifically remembering certain things. Uh, and of course, Everybody was doing flag things, and and seventy six in New York uh, was an interesting time. It was a very very rough time in New York. Um, the the city had really um, gotten beaten badly. People couldn't afford to live in the city, so they were leaving the city. There were strikes and all kinds of problems. And a lot of young, creative people, um, gay people, who's gay? Who ever heard of gay? Somebody, somebody that didn't find comfort in their hometown could come here because it was so cheap, because it was so dangerous. And the city filled with creativity. People from all over and women who found feminism in their own description, either left their marriages, left where they were, and created an identity in New mm. York. And so in that, in 76, New York was on fire of creativity. And Studio 54 yeah. opened, yeah, sure. it was, yeah. and that was the place everybody could go to express mm. themselves. Mm. So. It was a very, very creative time in New York, mm -hmm. and there was a real celebration. There were concerts and all kinds of things happening at Studio 54 and in the city. There was a real celebration for um, how New York, in its most creative mm -hmm. time, expressed that period. Mm -hmm. Now, your <laughs> story here... <laughs> Is well, I mean, first of all, I remember the bicentennial like it was yesterday. Uh, I was 11 years old in Haverhill, California. Um, and and look, in fifth grade, you know, that's when you start learning about American history. And so, I still remember every patriotic song that we were taught. I am not going to say it. Uh, <laughs> I still have actually, I carry it with me. I still have my bicentennial quarter, 25 cents for me back then was my life savings, but I have that and I found it you know, a year ago. And I that have is. It. I have it. I carry it with me. And, and, and again, you know, I, I remember very clearly 
seeing the tall ships on our black and white TV coming through Absolutely. the New York Harbor. Absolutely. That was a that was a global image. Yeah. That wasn't just a New yeah. York image. Yeah. That was a global image. Here's my here's my, oh my, my corner. There God, it is. Girl. There it is. There it is. Wow. Yes. Oh, that's yes. Isn't that great? Yeah. Uh, and I remember um, uh, we took a field trip um, to the Oakland train station where they had the Freedom Train. Right? The Freedom Train brought the national treasures around the country. And my mom, you know, we never would have been able to go to D.C. ever in a million years. So the fact that it came to us. Wow. Right? So, the, so those, the, my memories are, of, and, and of course, I'll never forget July 4th, 1976. It was a cloudy night in the Bay Area. But boy, those fireworks were the mm. fireworks of all fireworks. And when you're an 11 year old kid, right, right. that is, you know, a kid from nothing. I never felt more proud to be an American than that night, yeah. ever. Thinking to myself, there I am in Hayward. Uh, my mom had already left my dad. Um, you know, I was going to school. I loved my school. And um, it wasn't the worst life. And I kept thinking to myself, um, anything was possible. Mm -hmm. There is something very empowering yeah. about having the eyes of the world watching your mm -hmm. country that this is the place where every dream is possible. Yeah, yeah. That's what I felt. And I want my kids to feel that. I do feel like that's missing in terms of an appreciation of where we've come from, mm -hmm. but more importantly, where we can go. Yeah, yeah. And, and so, yes, yeah, so I was appointed by Senator Schumer to be a member of this congressional commission called America 250 in 2018. So this congressional commission, it's a 24 member commission established by legislation mm -hmm. by Congress. And the 24 members are populated by the House and Senate majority and minority leaders. So half Democrat, half Republican. And, and it also includes of the 24 members, eight standing members of Congress, four from the House, four from the Senate. Well, uh, last year, President Biden appointed me as chair. So who would have thought that this little 11 year old girl who was loving life, uh, celebrating the 200th anniversary of our nation's founding or, or De uh, Declaration of Independence is now leading the nation's efforts. And, and here's the irony. In 1986, I was actually Harvard's class representative for their 350th anniversary. Wow. So in, in 2026, which is when our country turns 250 years old, which is again, based on the signing of the Declaration mm -hmm. of Independence, is Harvard's going to turn 390 years old. Wow. So how, how ironic. And of course, no one knows this, by the way. It's not like anyone knew this wow. when I was appointed. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it is kind of a strange destiny, if mm -hmm. you will. Um, and, and I'm embracing this. I'm all in. Uh, and, and, and it couldn't be going better. So, you know, we did have some challenges out the gate way back when. Um, but I feel like we're on track to have the most comprehensive and inclusive commemoration and celebration this country and this world has ever seen you know look I, I mean you know while we are not the world the world is us mm -hmm. right and so if you go back to 1776 you know alaska was russia yeah uh california yeah was mexico yeah right uh, uh hawaii and, was its own kingdom yeah we had our country double its footprint with the louisiana purchase in 1801 mm -hmm. with, with france and spain and and so you know again unless you were indigenous or unless you were brought here by force you, 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 you know, we all are experiencing this mm -hmm. in a very different way. And I, and I want this to be something for everyone. I really do. And I am hoping mm -hmm. more than anything, I don't think it's an accident that the president would pick someone who's a daughter of immigrants, or I don't think it's an accident that he'd pick someone born and raised in Silicon Valley. The technology component that's going to be integrated into all of this is going to be, yeah. key. again, this is as much about the future as it is the past. And it is, it is about my kids. Absolutely. So um, when you, you're thinking about uh, a plan or how you want this to evolve and develop, who, who is funding it? Yeah, so, so thankfully, we have tremendous support from Congress, amazing support. In fact, uh, we now have, uh, you know, of, of the members of Congress of our commission, they've actually been the, the, our champions, huge champions. Um, I've met with all the appointing officials, their offices. So, so uh, uh, um, McConnell, Schumer, former leader uh, McCarthy, and, and leader Jeffries. Um, they all want this to be successful. All of them submitted videos That's on our right. behalf, um, except for McConnell, who, who wasn't well. But, but they all made it very clear that this has to work. Mm -hmm. This has to work. And 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 we received our appropriations 
Um, but I've also made a commitment. Look, I'm a fiscal conservative. I think that, that corporate America has to be part of this. Yeah, I was going to say. Cannot, we yeah. cannot rely on government funding to make this no. successful. So so this is one of the reasons why I'm here in New York for the week, is that I am meeting with our with our, our um, those who express an interest. Uh, we have a, a great programming framework that we're going to announce very, very soon. Um, since I became chair, uh, we've had a quorum every single meeting. It's been amazing. Uh, and so far, I don't know if you've heard, but we actually launched our very first public initiative this last 4th of July called America's Invitation uh, on americans50.org. So America's Invitation is exactly that. It's inviting the American public to share their story, mm -hmm. their video, their, their memory, their, their, their suggestion on how we should be highlighting mm -hmm. this, this milestone. And then our first public historical milestone is actually coming up. In Boston, it's the 250th anniversary of the Boston Tea Party on December wow. 16th. Oh, so really? I am taking the commission out of the DC bubble, out of the Philadelphia bubble, and to where the action is. Yeah. We are having our commission meeting in December in Boston. We are absolutely participating and actually making some very big announcements, huge announcements about what we're doing. And what we're doing is we're, we're using these regional meetings, these quarterly meetings mm -hmm. to make our regional and local announcements, our community partners, right. our, our, you know, our Boston partners, and, and of course, highlighting what's happening mm -hmm. with the Tea Party. So when we launched America's Invitation on July 4th, uh, we launched uh, in partnership with our community partners. So that's Nextdoor, which is a social media platform for neighborhoods. They're our community partner, awesome. YWCA, Great. and Major League Baseball. So when we launched, we launched intentionally in the great state of Wisconsin. A nice purple state. Uh, <laughs> we launched at the Milwaukee Brewers against the Chicago Cubs game. Baseball, hot dogs, and apple pie. And mm -hmm. a light touch to let people know that it's a three-year count-up, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. July 4th, 2023 right. is a three-year count-up to July 4th, 2026. And so now using these regional announcements as historic, from a historical perspective, right. but also, again, building the momentum from sea to shining sea. I say from mm -hmm. Fairbanks to Philadelphia, this has to be grassroots. Yeah. It has to be Main Street. And so how do people uh, learn more about it and get involved? I think the more people that are involved um, and have an experience Absolutely. with what you're doing, yeah. the, the, we will benefit as a country from that spirit being brought together. And if anybody can build the spirit within every American soul. You certainly <laughs> are the capable one. Oh my goodness. I can't even think <laughs> of anyone near a second. Oh my goodness. Um, but I, I think your positive energy and everybody clearly will know you're going to get the job done. And people like success and I'm sure if you wanted volunteers or people to be a part of this, there should be a way that they could. Absolutely. Reach out. Absolutely. So we'll, you, we'll put up whatever. Absolutely. AmericanGypsy.org is our website. And, and again, as we make these regional announcements and we start to announce what our programming framework is going to look like, yeah. again, we are soliciting ideas already from America's Invitation. And America's Invitation was really informed by, I don't know if you know this or not, but I'm the one that initiated and led the effort to place the portrait of a woman on our Federal Reserve notes for the first time in our country's history. So we had a public engagement process, I don't know if you remember, Jan, uh, mm -hmm. in the June of 2015, we launched, uh, when I was Treasury of the United States, we launched a very ambitious public engagement process that has never happened in any administration, where we used Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, uh, uh, emails, letters, roundtables for almost a year soliciting feedback from the, Ameri from the American public and who should be considered for our currency. And that led to the announcement of Harry Tubman on the $20 wow. bill in April yeah. 2016. That is what made me realize that this has to be out in Main Street. Yeah. This has yeah. to be, again, grassroots. This has to be yeah. all of us being able to see themselves mm -hmm. in this commemoration. Have you had a chance to see our, our video that we launched? No. I will play it for you when we're done because it is absolutely amazing. Well, we, we can attach it absolutely. to this. It's amazing. So, yeah. So that video, I think, is, is, is a great product of the process that we're using. So what we're making sure is that, again, everyone can see themselves in everything that we do. It is not going to be perfect. And we can't be all things to all people. Mm -hmm. But I'll, I'll give you a great example. So, so clearly, we needed extra capacity to make sure that we're focusing on the right themes, the right messaging, mm -hmm. the right... The right you know, articulation of what we're trying to accomplish. And so I created what I'm calling our professional services team, which is a set of, of outside consultants who uh, focus on public initiatives, 
and, and focus groups and research. You know, we want to make sure this is an open door. Mm. And so, in what what would you now? You remember as an eleven year old what that image was yeah. for you. Yeah. So, what do you want an eleven year old to experience in this new version? And we could talk about yeah. AI and yeah, stuff, sure. What What would you want her or him to take away? Yeah. So I think you, you said one word that was going to be the most important word that I could ever think of, which is connection. So, uh, you know, we have to feel like we're connected to something. It has to be something there for everyone. Right. And everything I do, you're going to find is always tactile. There's a physical component to everything that I do because your brain synapses react very differently when right. you touch something. You get into what I call the third dimension, yes. right? So, so when you when you touch a person, a thing, whatever, your brain gets into this emotional, very much, emotional yeah. place. So that connection is going to be very, very key. And so, you know, people ask me all the time, how do you know you're successful in 2026? I want as many Americans as possible to feel like this is the land of opportunity all over again. You have to feel it. And the way you're going to feel it is through connection. No doubt in my mind. So, uh, and that's going to mean very different things to very different people. And everyone has to own mm -hmm. their ability to connect to this, right? What it means for the past Mm -hmm. and what it means for the future. And look, I'm approaching this as a very kind of all-partisan, non-partisan, bipartisan perspective. Mm -hmm. It has to be that. Yeah. Then no matter who's in office, whether it's in Congress or the right. White House, no matter who's in office it has to hold in 2026, up. which is why we're doing mm -hmm. the public process, right? right? So, so when we develop this playbook, and the playbook, again, is happening as we speak, mm -hmm. that, that hard copy of that playbook is going to be delivered to Congress and the White House in January mm -hmm. of 2025, right? Whoever's in office in January 2025 in the 24 election, we can say America has yeah. spoken, and that and and I think uh, an important part of that would be uh, the generation, the generational differences, and each of the way they look at this, um, and making sure that they're all feeling a part of it, connecting, I, because it's clear that Gen Z and millennials. Yeah. Are, are so different yes. in the way they operate, the way yeah. they look at things. Yeah. Um, and baby boomers, I actually think in some odd way um, that I connect as a baby boomer to Gen Z and that they seem to connect to me in a certain way. And there's a- That's exactly right. And you know why that is? No, that's exactly right. Mm -hmm. And it's because, again, look, I mean, from, from, from you, from me, you know, I keep saying when I grew up, I want to think like them. I keep saying when I grew up, I want to be my daughter. I say that all the time because they see the world in a very fluid way, a very open way, mm -hmm. a very global way. Yeah. It's no longer competing against the kids sitting next to them in class, right. They're competing against Russia and China, right. etc. Right. So they th see the world in a very global approach. And it's a very, it, it's very liberating how they think, very liberating. Mm -hmm. And I think that kind of freedom of thought is similar to what happened, I think, in the 60s and 70s, yeah. where our country evolved in a very yeah. similar way. It was it was revolutionary. We were landing on the moon. Exactly. Had, um, ideas. I, I was working on a Univac computer in the 60s. Yes, so it was the first time anything would be thought of in that way. Uh, so uh, there is a similarity, but um, it's a creativity more than anything. It's a creativity, yeah, yeah. right? A, and so the tactile part of it, how are you yeah. going to achieve that one? Yeah. So, so let me just start by saying the legislation is very prescriptive in terms of what we can and can't do. But one of the things that it does highlight that we do have to do is a time capsule. Of course, absolutely, we're doing a time capsule. So, so you know, we think that a time capsule is probably it could be technology based, or it also could be you know a mosaic. Mm -hmm. Something from every state. It could be something very interesting, and mm -hmm. and, and again, you know, again, the threads of the fabric of this mm -hmm. community, whatever that looks right. like. There it does have to be a tactile component, and there will be a technology component. It has to be both. Yeah, it has to be yeah. both. I, absolutely. And so, so I will say though that one thing we also have done is something that I worked on for a number of years, which is um, I don't know if you've seen the the historical American Women on Quarter series, mm -hmm. but it's a ten year program. Uh, where it's going to be, uh, so the first quarter that was issued last year, in, in January of last year, was Maya Angelou. 
uh, I don't know if you've seen it, but it's the mm -hmm. first time in U.S. history that an African-American woman has been depicted on our coin or currency. Uh, and so that's a part of a 10-year program. It took me five years to pass that legislation. Uh, thank you to uh, <laughs> Congresswoman, uh, Congresswoman Barbara Lee, Congresswoman Bar Bonnie Watson Coleman, Speaker Pelosi is also very, very supportive. Um, we passed this legislation. Wow. Five years of my life it took me to pass this. But it's a 10-year program. So it's four years of women on quarters, five per year. So 20 women will be highlighted. I have some for you, by the way. I want you to pick and choose. I How think. exciting. Yes. Um, and then it turned into um, one year of our semi-quincentennial quarters. It's called semi-quincentennial, the 250th. And so our quarters will be included in that. In fact, all circulating coins will be redesigned for the 250th. And then it turns into four years of youth sports. Wow. Why, why did I choose that? Why did wow. we choose that? Wow. Because um, I want kids to see themselves. And I think sports, like I did for my kids, is a great way to engage kids. So what do kids collect these days? You tell me what they collect these days. When I grew up, we collected what? Cards. We collected cards. Yeah. We collected uh uh, stamps, we collected, um, uh, I collected bubble gum wrappers. Mm -hmm. um, but what do kids collect these days? They collect likes and followers, oh, right? Yeah, I was going to say right? social media. Right? Social you, know, media. And, and, you know, baseball cards are making right. come back, yeah, et cetera. But, but still. everything that I do, if you ever see, you know, when I found my voice as an accidental feminist, accidental educator, right. accidental historian, every initiative that I do always has a physical component. Always. Has to. So, yeah. so the, those four years of youth sports, is going to be key again for kids, boys and girls, yeah. to find themselves, yeah, right? Definitely. And then it ends with it gives the uh, the U.S. Mint the ability to produce the Olympics, uh, the medals for the Olympics in 2028. So this is a global effort, by the way, because in 2026 is also the World Cup, right? Where 11 cities in the U.S. will host the World Cup. That's so we are right. coordinating with FIFA. That's there is right. a national pl uh, international platform here, and again, these themes of democracy, which are all partisan, by the way which is a big thing for me. Mm -hmm. The theme of democracy will continue on through 2026 onto the Olympics of 2028 in LA. So this country is going to be in the spotlight on a global lens for a long time. This isn't a one and done. Yeah. This is not about an event. This, this is, is the great. journey. This is the journey. This is great. And, and I think for something as powerful as what you're doing, which it just isn't a celebration, I think this is realigning Americans our nation values to believe in the opportunities we have here and to find find the one voice on how we can join together make it happen yeah. and if anybody could get us to get together but you're so right it can't be one thing yeah. and then it's over it's like a wedding and then all that effort, what happened? This is a, a continuing build has to be. And, and reinforcement. And, and I think children, especially, especially Gen Z, yeah. desperately are looking for a connection. Yeah. They are the most disconnected, Absolutely. I think, from their identity yeah. as Americans. Yeah. And I think that they will find um, a creative way yeah. to to express that. Yeah. And you will give them a platform yeah. Absolutely. to do and, it. And this is even beyond Gen Z, right? So gen, technically, oh, Gen, sure, Z, technically but, Gen yeah. Z, you're 1996 to 2010. But you know, I, I think that whole concept of, of defining generations as 15 years is over. Mm -hmm. And again, it's the internet that's really flattened that point yeah. for all of us, right? So yeah. again, these kids that have access to everything, the good, the bad, and the ugly. But at the same time, they're much smarter from a content perspective mm -hmm. than we ever were at yeah. that same age. But they're also, it's much more challenging for them. Much more challenging very, in terms of, very of difficult. what they've been exposed yeah. to, yeah. what their brains haven't quite um, understand that they've been exposed to, and, and, and how they're taking all this in in a way that doesn't really allow them to see their future the way they should be mm -hmm. seeing it, right? So I am hoping that this is, you know, this, yes, we want to educate, we want to engage, we want to unite, but more than anything, I want to empower. I want to empower all of us to figure out what that collective voice looks mm -hmm. like, and more importantly, find that individual empowerment, yeah. right? Believe yeah. in yourself, believe in this country, and believe yeah. in yourself. This, the strength of that, I think, is going to be contagious. Um, tell me a little bit. I'm a, a big um, 
AI person. Oh, yeah. I have oh, two yeah. projects that I'm immersed in, and yeah. I love it. Yeah. And I think um, this is an incredible opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, Cats out of the bag. It's not going back in. No. And people need to embrace this. Yeah. And, and, and what people don't understand about AI, it's been around for a long time. The reason why it's getting a lot more attention now is that it's being institutionalized mm -hmm. and packaged in a way that's now going to be commercialized, right? And so how that works is, and, 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 and what I think people are, are afraid of is that the technology is compounding so quickly, mm -hmm. right? The generations of AI, you know, normally when you get from an iPhone, you know, eight to nine, yeah. you know, you wait a year or two. Right. A generation of AI is months. Yeah. It's yeah, months. Well, look, look at, and we went from three to 3.5 to right. four. And, and six, seven, eight. That's right. Are around, the the yeah. around the corner. Around the corner. All of it is around yeah. the corner. And so everyone's embracing it. And, it, and it, if you think about it, I mean, again, the challenge is, is you know, people are nervous about how do you regulate this? How do you put the brakes on? How do you, you know, um, and, and it's really hard to do that. Again, it's already out there. And so as a, as a business, but as a culture and as, a, as, as students, as all of this, this is an enormous opportunity, but there are responsibilities that come with mm -hmm. it. Huge responsibilities yeah. that come with it. But I absolutely, it's such an asset to what we're already doing. It's already been out there. Mm -hmm. But, you know, again, you just have to learn how to ride the wave. Yeah. And it's the biggest, the biggest thing that has happened for sure in my lifetime and beyond. That the biggest transformational uh, change in, in, the, in our globe, in our world, and the opportunities are just going to Endless. be extraordinary. Endless. It's going to be bigger than the World's Fair, <laughs> where my mother and father met in 1939, is what it's going to be. Well, but and, and, and on that note, it'd be great to see what does a World's Fair look like in 2026. Well, that's exactly yeah, it. That's, that's right. exactly yeah, that's it. it. So, and, it, and, it might, and, and, and the technology, I'll tell you right now, whatever we're going to do doesn't exist right now. It doesn't exist. And it, and it will um, start to build as we speak. That's right. And evolve into, while it's happening, yeah. um, this, this magnificent um, experience that we're all going to have. Yeah. And I'm, I'm just so grateful that you were chosen because I, I, if, if I didn't know you, which is why I want everybody to know you. <laughs> oh my if I didn't know you and somebody told me this is what they were going to do, I would say, that's <laughs> nice. <laughs> okay, that's nice. <laughs> it takes a super woman. It takes a super higher level human <laughs> being. And I mean that in, in the most deliberate way that you are that person and um and oh I goodness. think now everybody oh, well, thank that you. spent a little time with you will say maybe we need to see how we can get involved with it because oh it goodness. is going to be amazing well, thank, you. thank you we are going to uh likely do a formal process which is going to be really great to open the door for all to see what these ideas are because um you know when 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 next door the ceo of next door reached out to me sarah fryer whom i adore she reached out to me and she she sent me this email and in this email she said um next door activated over 18 million people across great britain to organize the lunches as part of the queen's jubilee and we want to do something similar oh, for really? you all. and i'm thinking how fabulous is that like they have the technology that's their skill set yep. that's their wherewithal yep. how perfect that they want to use that momentum on our behalf so they are one of our partners mm -hmm. so if we want to do it making this up you know, United Taste of America, where we do some type of cookout on July 4th yeah, at 2 p.m., yeah. whenever it is, right? And they'd be great to yeah. organize something like that, whatever it is. So so if there's proprietary technology that exists out there, I'm making this up. Maybe, you know, from Star Wars, you saw the Princess Leia hologram. Maybe there's something like that that someone's working on. We could do a, a tour of Mount Rushmore from your home. I'm making it up. Mm -hmm. But I'm sure that technology yeah. is going to be compounded over time. And meetups um, with a theme and, yes. you know, have all of these things happening at the same time exactly one of the things that um that i think of when i think of large populations of people doing something at the same time and the impact it has and every time i'm in the middle east and i'm also um, a maronite christian but every time i'm in the middle east 
And the call to prayer. Yes. Five times. Yes. Yeah. Everybody stops. Yeah. They say their prayer. Yeah. And they continue. And my dream for New York oh, is yeah. that 12 noon, one minute, that's it. We just stop. Okay. We don't have to pray. Yeah. We just think for a minute. Yeah. And I feel like this is an opportunity yeah. for us all at one time, maybe, Absolutely. to celebrate whether it's the Star Spangled no, Banner that's exactly or do, right. where we all do it at the yeah. same time, where we do things that's together. Right. That's right. That'll Just like happen. working out together, exactly. doing things together it has such an impact. And, yeah. and that, and doing it with people that are from different cultures. Yeah different experiences yeah. dressed in different ways yeah. different generations yeah Let, let's let's new york is going to be at the forefront of all of this for many many reasons one is i, I don't know if people know this or not but actually next year is the 400th anniversary of new york that's one uh, so we're on this count up of you know next year is also the 250th anniversary of of the the first continental congress so it's going to be a big year next mm -hmm. year all these historic milestone historical milestones are going to be part of this but new york as you recall is the first capital of our country yeah and we have federal hall here um, and, and, and let's not forget, of course, for me personally, um, 2026 is the 25 year anniversary of 9-11. Uh, that will absolutely right. be at the forefront of our commemoration and our, our moment of reflection. Right, right. Very interesting. Yeah. So, um, yeah. so personally, um, obviously you, you're not afraid of adventure. You like to do lots of different things. <laughs> your your energy is exciting and contagious. Um, so personally, because we all want balance, yeah. right? Um, what what are your personal? I I think especially after your mom passed, and yeah. I I am remembering where I was at that time. What are you thinking about personally? Uh, for 2026, or just, just for in you, general, for you. Uh, you know, it's all about my kids. So, so my mom was my life, and she still is. She still is my life. She still burns inside of me every day. Um, but it is about my kids, and 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 it is about my daughter specifically. Uh, you know, I, I have this phrase. Uh, you know, my son will be fine. My daughter has to climb. That that absolutely is going to be the case. Mm -hmm. That's just unfortunately that's the way it is. That's just yeah. the way it is. But. Uh, you know, it's, it's funny, uh, growing up, my, my son, who was just such an amazing, Just fun, from that little the kid, thing he wrote, I, oh, I'm in love with him. He's, he's a great yeah. kid. But we've all agreed, you know, Joey, you know, when you grow up, you're going to make a great vice president to Berkey. Because she, you know, she, she, she's the one. And she came out that way. And, and she, she has this, um, she takes life by the horns in ways that I would never have been able to. You know, she was the only girl in the Boys Little League before we moved from California. Um, uh, we couldn't find a team in DC that would accept her uh, because she was playing at such a high level for her age. So she gave up baseball and moved on to basketball. My little you know, <laughs> five foot pixie, 90 pounds on a good day, maybe at the time, developed this outside, outside three point shot where she became the captain of the varsity girls no, basketball team in one no. of the most competitive public schools in the country and, you know, and, and made the record for the most three points in a game. That's her. What is she doing now? Oh, I'm just, she graduated six months early from UC Davis. And immediately, you know, I, I, for her graduation, I gave her 400,000 miles. I said, go see the world. Go visit your friends who are still in school. I go love it. You know she did? She just put her head down and worked like crazy. She got into graduate school. She was still 21 when she started, and she's getting her doctorate in psychology with this intersection between mental health and sports. I mean, she's the world. She is. She is the future. And, and, and she never, and she's the most fun. She's such a joy. I'm both my kids. I call my, you know, my son Joey, Joyous Joey. They're so much fun. Mm -hmm. And I said, I, they're the members, I call them the members of the 4-H club. Head, health, humor, and heart. Just the best kids. There's nothing I would change about them. Well, I, I clearly... You have your mother, and they have you, and that is, you know, the gift you gave them is the ability to be those people, and that's what's so extraordinary. And I, I, I just am so lucky that I met you, and that 
um, your energy can be shared, and that you're you're going to impact this country. You already do, but I think Thank this you. project and everything else you do. Thank you. Um, I don't know how many people are going to want you to run for political auto Never. Never. I just know Never. that we need leadership that looks like you, acts Thank like you, you and talks you. like you, thinks like you, and is a, as important to the survival of our history and our country. And I think you're the just the perfect person. Oh, gosh. I'm, I'm thrilled. I'm, I'm, I'm you, thrilled. You, know, you know how this was pitched to me? You gotta love this. So, I mean, I'm, I'm still working. I still have to work. And I, my, my daughter's in school. I'll never go when this was first pitched to me. And this person said to me, look, in the spirit of John Warner for the Bicentennial, Lee Iacocca for the Statue of Liberty, Michael Bloomberg for the uh, 9-11, and, and Mitt Romney for the Salt Lake City Olympics, you will be the first woman to ever head a historical milestone international significance in this country and my first thought was are you kidding me first of all <laughs> they're all billionaires <laughs> like you know john warner was married to elizabeth taylor I'm like wait 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 but no, how no, they like, get that? wait a minute so, so they got to bring in their own teams you know i don't think any of them had to work under their congressional right. commission construct they just came in and you know <clears throat> guns blazing right. I still have to, I'm a volunteer. I still have to work. I'm still doing my I, I, I was, <laughs> the, the, as the list was going on, I was like, okay, I got the theme. I get the theme and then, okay. Oh my God. That's creative. So, but look, I mean, I was hesitant. I really was hesitant when, when this was, when I was first asked to do this, I was very hesitant just because, and my mom was ill at the time and, mm. Uh, but I'm all in, and 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 you realize, I realize very very quickly that one, our leadership wants us to work. All the appointing officials, Democrat and Republican, our members of Congress, our Congressional Caucus, our commissioners, they all don't just want this to work. They've made it very clear it has, has to, work. to work. Yeah, it has to work. It, it's so true. I I think at this time in history. And because I'm 78, I have a perspective here a little bit more than you might imagine. But I, at, at this time in the history of our country, this event, I think, could be an important glue, an important experience that we can all have together. And um, I know you're going to come up with the, I just know people will want to share ideas and participate. And, yeah. and I'm sure everyone who will listen to this, and I certainly am your humble servant. Oh, goodness. Oh. You're if you cry. need a hem oh, sewn, ladies whatever. and gentlemen, Norma Kamali, oh I would. God. I'm. I'm. I'm proud oh, to be gosh. a New Yorker. I love the ability that my. I've led a creative life in this country. I came from humble beginnings. My mom was a single mom too, and we really did not have the 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 privilege that anybody would think you would have to have but I was so lucky to live this education my mother is the same thing but we have to make sure that that dream lives 